This is the Plowman, John Plowman's, amen, pictures and talks by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And uh, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence like you can't read the book. I'm just reading these chapters and making comments and scripture evaluations, okay? And um, he's got a little picture here, and it shows this guy uh, looking at his finger like it's all burnt and everything, and a woman raising her finger going like this to him, amen? Apparently he had put his finger in a pie. And the entitle of this is, he would put his finger in the pie, and so he burnt his nail off. I said, whoa. Then we'll get on with the story. Some men must have a finger in every pie. Or as the prov proverb hath, hath it, their oar must be in every man's boat. They seem to have no business except to poke their noses into other people's business. They ought to have snubbed noses, for they are pretty sure to be snubbed. Prying and spying, peddling and meddling, these folks are in everybody's way, like the old toll gate. They come without being sent for, stop without being asked, and cannot be got rid of unless you take them by the left leg and throw them downstairs. <laughs> and if you do do that, they will limp up again and hope they don't intrude. <laughs> no one pays them, and yet they give advice more often than any lawyer. And though no one ever thanks them, yet there they are, peeping through keyholes and listening under eaves. They are as great as asking questions as if they wanted you to say the catechism and as eager to give their opinion as if you had gone down on your knees to ask it. These folks are like dogs that fetch and carry. They run all over the place like, like starlings when they are feeding their young. They make much ado, but never do much, unless it is mischief, and at this they are apt as jackdaws. I don't know what that means. I may have cussed from the pulpit. If any man has such... If any man has such people for his acquaintances, he may well say, say, save me from my friends. I know your assistance you'll lend. When I want it, I'll speedily send. You need not be making such stir, but mind your own business, good sir. It is of no more use than if we spoke to the pigs, for here is Paul, pry again. Paul and his cousins are most offensive people, but you cannot offend them if you try. Well, do I remember the words of a wise old Quaker. John said he, be not concerned with that which concerns not thee. This taught me a lesson, and I made up my mind not to scrub other people's pigs for fear I should soon want scrubbing myself. There is a woman in our village who finds fault with all, and all find fault with her. They say her teeth are all loose through her tongue, rubbing against them. If she could but hold her tongue, she would be happy enough, but that's the difficulty. Then another little poem. When hens fall a cackling, take heed to the nest. When drabs fall a whispering, farewell to thy rest. Will Shepherd was sitting very quiet while others were running down their neighbors. At last, the loose fellow sung out, Look at old Will. He is as silent as a stockfish. Is it because he is a wise? Is it because he's wise or because he is a fool? Well, said Will, you may settle that question how you like, but I have been told that a fool cannot be silent. Will is set down at, as very odd, but he is generally even with them before he has done. One thing is sure, he cares very little what they do say, so long as they don't worry his sheep. He hummed in my ear an old-fashioned verse or two the other evening, something like this. Since folks will judge me every day, let every man his judgment say. I will take it all as children's play, for I am as I am, whoever say nay. Many there be that take delight to judge a man's ways and envy and spite. But whether they judge me wrong or right, I am as I am, and so do I write. How the truth is, I leave you. Judge as you list. Whether false or true, you know no more than before you knew. For I am as I am, whatever ensue. If folks will meddle with our business, it is best to take no notice of them. There is no putting them out like letting them stop where they are. They are never so offended as when people neither offend them nor take offense at them. You might as soon stop all the frogs from croaking as quiet idle gossips when they once get on the chat. Stuff your ear with wool and let them jabber till their tongue lies still, because they have worn all the skin off it. Where no wood is, the fire goeth out, and if you don't answer them, they can't make a blaze for want of fuel. Treat them kindly, but don't give them the treat of quarreling with them. Follow peace with all men, even if you cannot overtake it. 
Uh, pretty, pretty sound advice, amen. Well, so this is the plowman, and I just entitled it "Having a Finger in Everybody's Pie." I don't know. Go to Psalms one nineteen eleven. When you get instructed from Proverbs, it's you know it's everybody. It's a, there's a growth. Do you understand it? There's a growth period in everybody's life. You have to grow up. And, and that's why a lot of times it's, it's best to listen to people that have children because they've had children. And that makes sense? And they know how these children go through these certain phases and, uh, and how you deal with them, you know. It's interesting because as Christians, as you grow as children, you still got the character that you had when you became saved. So things have to develop, things have to grow. And a lot of times people are taking offense about everything. You ought to just listen to the Bible and take instruction like a wise son, and uh, it'll be right with you. But here in verse 11 of Psalms 119, um, it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Now, this is just very simple. First point is memorize scripture about your specific problem. Just memorize scripture about your specific problem, whatever problem it is. If it's a mouth problem, look up the scriptures, Right? If it's a sensual problem, there's stuff in there. Any, 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 every, any, every member that you have, you probably have problems with because it's called sin nature. So whatever you is overpowering you, whatever that particular member is, it would do you great justice to look up a scripture on that particular thing, get a verse, right, and memorize it. Hide it in your heart. And uh, that's the power of the Word of God. People, see, people, I, I think the reason why we have more problems is because we claim to be Bible believers. You, you, sometimes you wonder why other people don't have the same problem. See, we're claiming something here. We're claiming that we've got God's infallible, inerrant, most powerful word of God. So by you claiming that, it's got to work effectually in your life. That means you have to believe it. And if you believe it, then when you get preached to or you get taught to or something comes up, you look personally in your Bible. You get a strong concordance or something. If you don't have one, come to my office, say you want to borrow for a minute, write down some scriptures or something. Look over those verses that you're having a problem with in a particular time of your life, whatever you're, whatever you're going through. Wouldn't that make sense? And you get the verse and just start memorizing it. Say, Lord, uh, this is your word. Uh, you, and and, and what, what do you do with the God? You take him to Psalms 119.11. You say, Lord, this is your word. Right? You said, if I hide your word in my heart, did I not do this sin against thee? Now we're talking about physical. Whenever I preach or anything, when we talk about the old nature, we're talking about keeping that old nature down. We're talking about this or that or the other thing. We're not talking about your, where you're at now, amen? I mean, I wish we all didn't have this flesh, then you'll see we don't need this kind of preaching. But uh, since we're in the body, there's certain things that come up. And, and I don't care if you're 100 years old, if you just learn this truth, get a verse on it. Get a verse on it. I mean, isn't that the whole thing? If you're working with somebody at work, uh, you've already got, in a Bible-believing church, you should already have enough verses against Mormons, against Pentecostals, against this, against that, against, you know what I mean? I mean, to use the sword to get them. But my goodness, the first thing is they're lost. They don't need, they don't, <laughs> they don't, you know, when we first started off, I think it was that Kopachevsky said the same thing, like to ruin his, his family, he's a Catholic. And man, he wrote, what, seven pages? I forgot what he said, he wrote like a book to his family on how Catholic Church is the whore. And then I cry. You know how long it takes you after they read that, after somebody reads that, to try to reach them for the Lord? You may never do it. You know. And so just tell them what the Lord's done for you and how good the Lord's been and how you're so glad you received the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. And let them say, yeah, but you were raised in a good church. Well, I know I was raised in that. And yeah, we, we believe the Trinity. We believe the marriage. But you know what? I never asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me. And they may, you may go away and they may think about that for a while. They may say, you know what? I never did either. And there has been a change in him or her. See, stuff like that is wisdom. But at any rate, after reading the plowman, you need to take responsibility upon yourself, find out whatever it is that's bothering you, get a verse on it yourself, and watch God work in you for you, who you are. And that's a blessing, man, once God starts giving you victory, like answer to a certain, that's God working in you, you see? And uh, that's a blessing. So memorize scripture about your specific problem. And uh, two, go to Psalms 1914. Psalms 1914. Talk right. <laughs> Talk right. 
I mean, if you ever do all of Psalms 19, do a study on Psalms 19, they're just practical stuff. I mean, goodness gracious. I got under conviction, but 14 really gets me. We got a song the kids used to know. They used to sing this. Let the words of my mouth, remember that? A meditation of my heart. Remember that? Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. See that? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Why is that connection? Because abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Speaketh. Speaketh. And it says, for what? Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. He is your strength, and he's definitely your redeemer. So to talk right, you need to think about things like that, that he's present. And you want your words to be right in his sight. I mean, that takes thought. I mean, you know, and that takes time. It just doesn't happen overnight. You have to watch what you're saying. And the only way you can watch it, you ever hear somebody say, watch what you're saying. You know, it doesn't make sense, does it? It should be hear what you're saying. But we say, watch what you're saying. Because in your mind, when you speak, they're words. And they are spelt out. Uh, I think I was talking to uh, Brother Friesen there, and we was talking about this. I took that, um, when I went through a job course, they made me take that speed reading course. And uh, you get keywords, and you just be able to go through a page. Zap, zap. I mean, I can go down a page, and I can, get, I can, I can do that until I think about it. When I think about trying to speed read, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I go back to every word. The boy saw the dog. You know, it's amazing how your mind is. And, uh, and but it's, it's a control of your thought, isn't it? That's, what the, that's all that is. If you get to type in the home roll, once you memorize that home roll and you start to type, boy, you can whiz right through there. But as soon as you try to think about what you're doing, guess what happens? You wonder if your fingers are on the home row and if you're still typing right, and you'll slow right down. You can't, you can't do that. See, once you develop the habit, that's like a natural thing. But in order to get that habit going, you have to fight a lot of obstacles. And so a lot of times we'll say stuff and we'll, you know, we'll do things. We all do it. But uh, the Holy Spirit will convict you of certain things. And then after that, you have to purpose in your heart that you want to be helped. You want to learn. You want to add knowledge to your lips and... Put a guard on your lips like the Bible says, uh, because uh, uh, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we saw that you need to memorize scripture for a problem. You need to talk right. And then go to James chapter 3. I know we've all read this. <clears throat> but you need to have knowledge of your members. And knowledge of one member in specific would be the mouth. <clears throat> we know the old expression from World War II is loose lips sink ships. And it's amazing how in World War II you have a complete country that really kept their mouth shut. I was reading an article on that, you know, how Japanese had spies in our country and all that. That's how they found out where Pearl Harbor and all that stuff was. But they were coming to the West Coast. They wanted to blow up a bunch of stuff over on the West Coast. Remember the Coral Sea battle right there? God intervened and had some pilot go off course and saw that, uh, uh, that whole fleet of Japanese uh, vessels coming towards us. And, uh, but uh, nonetheless, there was plants in here. They had spies. The German Nazis had spies. Uh, they could have devastated us. They could have blew up our, our, iron, our steel factories. Uh, they could have did a whole lot of things that there was a lot of talk going on. But that was the thing that they passed around, and people were patriotic. People were patriotic enough to keep their mouth shut. In a, in a huge country like ours. What an amazing thing. You can hang it up now. Everybody for a price, they'll sell us down the tube, man. But uh, let's read the first six verses. And <clears throat> it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things, now as you see right off the bat, many masters. You ever, you ever around people, got, got, they just know everything. I was like that. God started whooping on me. And uh, it's hard to just know a couple things good all the way through. But you can get around some people. They just, I mean, bless God, they just know. They're going to throw down everything. And, you know, when God dies, they're still around. But you'll get around people like that sometimes. So that's what he's, he's starting off saying. Don't be masters of everything, man, because I'm telling you what, you're going to be judged for that stuff. Uh, so anyway, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a what? Perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Isn't that interesting? In other words, if you can control your mouth, apparently, 
You got it down. <laughs> Apparently, the other part of your body ain't going. The other parts of your body ain't going to affect you. So that's a pretty heavy duty thing, you know. And um, behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Do you ever really think about that? Some stuff you say may excite certain parts of your body and cause your body to do other kinds of things. Isn't that amazing? How sometimes you can say something, next thing you know you want to fight somebody. You know? How about how does immorality start? A man saying certain things to a woman. A woman saying certain things to a man. The mouth. Wrong kind of things. What goes with those words? Spirits. Yeah. Because it's the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever's inside comes out, doesn't it? That's why sometimes when you think certain things, you do something, sometimes better not to say anything. Because sometimes you're not thinking right. If you're not thinking right and you say something, it can start a whole lot of other things into action. That's why I'm glad when I, if you, if you, if you go over that, that verse 6 again, just look how that, that's worded. And the tongue is a fire and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among, among, among our members, that it defileth the what? Whole body. That's what it means and setteth on fire the course of what? Nature. Ain't talking about your divine nature, bless God. And that's why you see everything on the movies now, every, every kind of thing you watch is be a man talking to a woman, you know, sensually or something, or a woman trying to hit on a guy, and then the body goes with it. Amen? Okay, we don't want to get into that. I'll be into some other kind of class here. Um, okay, so just knowledge of your members would be good. We all mess up or it wouldn't be in there. These verses wouldn't be in there if we didn't all mess up. It's all part of the characteristic of the flesh. It just, it's just the amount of who's disciplined and who's not. Who understands that he's got a problem with his mouth and who doesn't understand he's got a problem with his mouth. Some people will sit and hear a teaching like this and they'll just go over their head and they'll just say, no way. Now, this applies to everybody. We all have problems with your members. It's just the amount of how much discipline you want to get, get together and, you know, slow yourself down. And the only way I know how to do that is to be first get under conviction of a problem and then ask God for help. That's the way you do that. And then if he says get a verse and get a verse on it. Get that verse and memorize it, bless God. Just go over it. And every time you blow it or something, you have to apologize or something. Just, just take that verse into your heart and say, you know, quote that thing. Say, oh God, I want this in my life. Say, I want this Bible in my life. I want this Bible to control my life. Because you can't do it. And then also study to be quiet. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking about having a finger in everybody's pie, amen. I remember it was an honor, and I do say that, and it's on tape. It was an honor to be invited over to Dr. Ruckman's, and I sat at the table with him and fellowshiped, and we got to eat. It's very good food, good fellowship. <coughs> and... Uh, just to listen, you know, you get a lot of, just to listen was something else, and to observe everybody. <laughs> you know, I like doing that. I was like, listen, observe. It was a blessing going over there. But afterwards, if you see him walk, he was walking by us, and you see how people come on him like fleas on a dog, and just to listen to some people, you know? And it's like he would stop and answer somebody, and it would be like a gnat on him. He, you know, he, I was one I was like, you could tell I was training at this guy, you know, he's like, you know, somebody please get this guy out of my stinking face, because he got, you know, and he'd just walk on, but, 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 doctor, you know, he'd just walk on, you know, he did this every time, he'd sit and be real cordial with somebody, I mean, like, almost like brothers, and be talking with this guy or this lady or something like this, sign a little kid's Bible, and then you have these people just, just, and they were the same people that was just, while everything else was going on, they were the same people that just, after it was over, and they're just the same people just, just all the time running their mouth. There's the same people that when, when they were preaching, Kopachevsky and I remember when he was preaching, they would go. I 
that. Don't be overtaken by the Spirit of God that's working through the man of God behind the pulpit of God. You know, we've got a better way. Just calm down, man. Amen? Just relax. It'd be all right. It'd be all right. It was good practical preaching down there. I liked it. Yeah, I even like Jim Lynch. Jim Lynch. He was all right, too, wasn't he? Amen. Okay, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <coughs> Study to be quiet, verse 11. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. I know you don't believe that, but it is. It really is. Look what he says. He says, and that you study to be what? You, you ever do a study of the word study? It's work. <laughs> there ain't no way around it, man. It takes work. Study to show yourself approved. Remember that? It takes work. You just don't put on a tape with a little bit of earphones and that's it. No, you, you got, it takes work. You have to apply yourself. And if he's telling you right off the bat, and that you study to be quiet, it means it takes work to be quiet. It really does and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. It's a commandment. In other words, shut up. Do your work right. Your business. Isn't that amazing? And everybody that's ever ran a job or had people under them, you know you get people like that and less work's done because they're talking to everybody else, running around doing everything else. You say, hey, man, you got this stuff done yet? Well, yeah, I did, you know. No, you didn't. You've been trying to, you talk to this guy and slowed him down. You talk to that guy slowed that guy. Can't, I'm paying you to work. Shut your mouth and do your job. Man. And they got to do that over and over again with some people until they finally fire them. Or a union keeps them in and they go to a different department and drive that guy crazy. Or they just leave them alone and make you work harder because you're trying to do right. So they'll just wait, work you to death. But anyway, study the, the, and we can go through the whole characteristics there too, but we're not. We're just, just showing you this. Study to be quiet. And then um, don't be out of order. You know, isn't that, isn't that amazing? Everybody's having a ball or, 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 you're, or you're talking about something. Maybe you've been to a meeting and how great it was. And everybody's enthused. And all of a sudden somebody comes in off the wall and just starts spewing out stuff. And you're saying... Did you know President Bush was the Antichrist? And you're talking about all this good stuff. And you're saying, I mean, where did that come from? You know? Did you know that this was happening? Did you know this was happening? Next thing you know, the whole group was like, Brr. man. I mean, if you come in, listen to what everybody's talking about. Don't throw monkey wrenches in the conversation. Man. If everybody's happy and, you know, serving the Lord and loving the Lord and everything, don't come here and just drop a bomb on them. I mean, good enough. Take a break. So don't be out of order. Find something to do, or you'll be a busybody. Amen? Now go to 2 Thessalonians. You're right there. 311. <clears throat> 3.11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but our what? Busybodies. See, that's why working's important. Keep, you know, when, it, when the old wives tell about idle minds the devil's workshop, that's exactly right. And you know that. Everyone here knows that. You've been laid off for a length of time, or, or you've been sickly, or you've been, you've been out of work not doing nothing. You know how your mind works. If you're not doing, I'm telling you what, if you're not busy or thinking stuff, that devil knows how to put that stuff in there. Next thing you know, you forget about yourself, and you want to get in everybody else's business. That's being a busybody. Why? Because you're not, you're not working. That's what it says. But Paul's instruction is in verse uh, 12. He says, now, he says, Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, whew, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Isn't that amazing? With quietness eat their own bread. Now, let's look at his instruction in verse 12. You see that again? With quietness they work and eat their own bread. Now we have an admonition to the body of Christ about a problem child. Don't forget these other verses. Look at verse 14 and 15. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, 
note that man and have, now watch it, no company with him, that he may be what? Ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, separation is, is to correct and not to condemn the individual to hell. We're talking about a brother in the Lord. But when you don't take admonition from the pulpit, if you don't take instruction, how in the world, if you're pleasing somebody, if you're giving them that, 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 uh, that relief that maybe they're doing something right when they're doing something wrong, you're at fault. And God may judge you and them together. In other words, there's a time when you ought to know when to separate. Go to Romans 16. <clears throat> See, this stuff here is not, I didn't, I didn't think of somebody in here and do this. We're just teaching instruction, and you need to get, pick up on that instruction and understand because you don't want to be part and parcel of something that's going to get God mad because you, I'm telling you, he won't leave you out. <laughs> But here in chapter 16, look at um, verse 17. Now I beseech you, remember that word beseech, remember begging? I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause what? Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and do what? Now what do you think that means? This is, your, this is Paul, isn't it? Stay away. Separate yourself. You're not helping people. Well, you know, I got to love and I'm just going to straighten them up. No, you're going to be screwed up. You're going to be messed up because you're going to get their spirits. And if you don't think their spirits with words, you hang around with somebody that's constantly dragging somebody down, I guarantee you'll be down. Their spirits. Um... I don't know how else to explain that. They latch on to you like a stinking magnet, man. You are. You are a magnet. I don't know what else to say. You're a spiritual person. Do you understand that? You're living in the spirit world whether you like it or not. The problem is you just ain't got sense enough to figure that out yet. If you're constantly hanging around with people that are doing uh, alcohol and drugging it and stuff like this and you're a Christian, I'm telling you what, you're out to lunch. You're just strictly out to lunch. Because that's why you can't get victory over anything in your stinking life. You're not separating yourself. So you're supposed to separate from these kinds of people onto God. What does God want you to do? What does God want you to see? What does God want you to listen to? It's up to you to separate. Man, don't let him do it. Because you hear, you hear uh, testimony after testimony about, oh, he died. I didn't have a chance to witness to him. Why? You're living just like him. Living just like her. You know, there's, there's verses in the Bible, people, that tell you, and we're talking about Christians. Did you notice that? Brethren, sometimes you just can't help somebody unless they want help. You've got to know when they want it. A person, I never saw a person wanting help that keeps giving advice. Every time I think I'm going to help somebody sometime, you'll come across the same kind of people. After about two minutes, they'll start giving you instruction and advice. And you'll say to yourself, yeah, I, guess, I guess I wasn't needed here. I mean, everything's cool, copacetic with them, I guess. I guess I misjudged. I guess I misdid this. Next thing you know, you're messed up. And if you keep listening to them, you'll pick up on the spirit that they have. <coughs> Honest. But you need to be polite. But tell them you are not interested in everyone's faults. You and God are working on yours. Amen. Conversation is important for human beings. Christian conversation should be encouraging, stimulating, hopeful, and educational. It really should. I mean, even when you're talking about hunting or fishing, I mean, that would be fun, right? It shouldn't be about belittling people and tearing them down. You should be, man, I'm, I'm encouraged, you know. Man, I get to go hunting, get to do the, go fishing, get to do, I mean, how in the world can you complain about stuff like that? Ought to be fun, shouldn't it? I mean, should, I mean that should be interesting. I mean, yeah, I saw that deer and it was right, you know, and I did this. I mean, everything, it ought to be fun. But to listen to some people, it gets downright critical. Stuff like that ought to be fun. You're enjoying yourself. You're able to be in a free country and go hunting and fishing, do all these neat stuff. 
My goodness. Shoot. I mean, I'd hate to go ask somebody advice on a bow and me just start to get bow hunting and getting all together and have another person come up to me and say, oh, well, that jerk sold you the wrong thing. Oh, man, look at this old man. You're, you know, next thing you know, I'm... It's bad, man. It's bad. You know that ain't right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Golfing or anything. You get around Christians sometimes, I'm telling you what, they make a good thing bummed out. I mean, I mean, if we wanted to be bummed out, we could have been bummed out at Ed's cabin, amen? Raining. I mean, we was hunting. I mean, it was just, I mean, we could have complained about the rain, the deer, the... I was just so excited about being there in the cabin up north, amen, with my kids. It's all right with me. We had fun. We enjoyed it. But I, I've been places where, yep, you know, why'd you put the outhouse by the pine tree? Why'd you put it over by the maple? You know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And all of a sudden you're saying, my goodness, man. Calm down. It'll be all right. For tomorrow we may die. But you get that. You get that. That's just, it's just the flesh. It's just the flesh. So Proverbs 13, 20, we'll conclude with that. Bible says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You get a jail ministry going, you go in and, uh, you know, talk with people in there, and I'm telling you what, you get Christians and you find out who they hung around with, what they were doing, and they wish they never would have. You go down to the pregnancy center over there and you talk to some of them young gals that were from Christian homes and everything, and they'll tell you. Didn't listen to their mama, didn't listen to their daddy, listened to their peers, hung around with them. Next thing you know, they're knocked up. Now what are they going to do? You got to love them, you got to comfort them. You, gotta, you, you pray and hope they don't get an abortion. But a lot of times when we get these young girls, they've already had an abortion. And I mean, it's devastating to them. And we tell them they're forgiven, they're going to heaven, you don't have to worry about it. But you know what? The rest of their life, they live in the flesh until they die and go home to be with Jesus and in the back of their mind, you know what the devil picks on? That. You know, just because they don't hang around with the right people. And they were told to do so. They were taught better than that. I'm telling you, people will bring you down. Listen to their words. Listen to how they're talking. Sometimes people have a problem. You just pray for them. Sometimes people are just so lonely. They have no fellowship with anybody. You should be able to understand that. But don't get caught up with stuff. Amen? You know what the doctrine is. You know what God wants you to do on planet Earth. Amen? Somebody contrary to that, watch them. Mark them. You know, because the only way they're going to learn is pretty soon they're going to look around they don't have a they don't have a soapbox. They don't have an audience anymore. And they're going to wonder, well, why is it nobody listening to me anymore? And maybe the Holy Ghost will start talking to them. And they say, well, what do you have to say? You know, what do you have to say? I'm telling you, it's, and you know yourself, it's, if somebody's getting in your business, everybody else's business, it sort of makes you aggravated anyway. So the plowman, amen, having a finger in everybody's pie, amen, no good. Like the illustration was, he put in his finger, pulled out, and the, the nail was burnt off, amen. It was a good cartoon, I thought it was a good study.